We're in Psalm 52, 53, and Psalm 54 this evening. Beginning at uh, verse 1 here in Psalm 52, this is a psalm of David. And uh, it begins in verse 1, Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good and lying rather than speaking righteousness. Selah. You love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, Here's the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. So, as we look at this particular psalm here, it's a cheery little psalm. As we look at it, Psalm 52 is intended to contrast the faith of King David who wrote Psalm 52 with the treachery of a, a man that uh, we, we hold to be uh, by the name of Doeg, who was uh, recorded, it's recorded uh, concerning him in 1 Samuel. And let me give you a little bit of a background as we look at this particular uh, psalm, and then I'll give you um, a teaching in it. Hopefully, we'll look at some application. But um, King David was the second king of Israel. When you read your Bible, you'll note that the first king of Israel was a man by the name of Saul. And King Saul, the first king of Israel, had, uh, had a great disdain, dislike, and even a hatred for David. And because Saul knew that he would be replaced and feared that David would be the one who replaced him, Saul became angry at him and began to persecute and afflict him. David began to be associated as an enemy of the nation of Israel, and Saul began hunting him down. So on one occasion, David was fleeing from Saul, and he ended up in a city belonging to uh, Benjamin uh, by the name of Nob. And what had happened is, while he was there, he spoke to the priest and he said, I don't have anything to eat and I don't have a weapon. I'm on the king's business. Uh, can you supply me with these things? And so he was supplied with bread and he also received the sword of Goliath. While David was there, there was also a man who was under Saul who was there at the same time. His name was Doeg. And Doeg saw what was done for David. So later on, Saul began to question his men. And basically was saying to his men, none of you are supporting me, none of you really are helping me in my fight against David and all, but Doeg was there and Doeg said, look at, I saw what was done on behalf of David. And he basically shared concerning how David had received the sword and how David had received bread and all. And so what happens is uh, as a result of that, Saul desires to kill the priests who had supplied the things for David. If you take notes, it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 22. Let me read to you from verses 18 to 21 and show you what happened. It says, The king said to Doeg, You turn and kill the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priests and killed on that day 85 men who wore a linen ephod. Also Nob, the city of the priests, he struck with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and nursing infants, oxen and donkeys and sheep, with the edge of the sword. Now one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the Lord's priests. So Doeg was somebody who actually slew the priests of the Lord at the command of Saul. He was an enemy of David. He hated David. And that's the person that David is speaking about here in Psalm 52. He's speaking about this man and what he had done. And so in verse 1 here in Psalm 52, he asks the question, Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. And I want you to notice something here. Even as he begins, he speaks concerning the ungodly and the way the ungodly are. Notice one of the traits of the wicked. Notice how he says, Why do you boast in evil? That's a trait of a wicked person. They boast in their sin. They boast in their adventures. They boast in their, in their power. They boast in their accomplishments. 
A person who doesn't know the Lord has a tendency of bragging about the evil things that they do. They might brag about how drunk they got the night before, how they partied all night long. They might start boasting about the fights they've been into, the things that they've stolen, the women that they've, that they've been with, everything. They want to boast in evil, and that's the trait of an ungodly person. An ungodly person wants to show you how bad they are. An ungodly person boasts in the evil that they do. And that's why he asks here in Psalm 52, verse 1, why do you boast in evil? Why do you do that? You see, in contrast, a person who loves the Lord still is going to have the ability to sin. We know that we're not perfect, and we know that we're not going to be perfect this side of heaven, but there's a difference. I, I can blow it, and I do. I blow it every day in, in, in thought, in word, or in deed. No, not a single one of us today went through this day um, without sinning. Now, somebody right now says, no, I did. I, I went through. You just lied, so you just sinned. <laughs> no, not a single one of us has gone through this whole day without sinning at least one time. I mean, that's just human nature, and we all understand that. But the difference is, is we don't brag about it. See, a believer doesn't run around boasting about their evil. A believer doesn't go out bragging about the things that they've done. As a matter of fact, a believer actually regrets what they've done, repents over what they've done, and sorrows in heart because they did that. That's the difference. A non-believer, a non-Christian, sins and, and makes excuses for it, says it's just the way I am, no big deal, I've done worse. But a believer will say, you know what, I've sinned against the Lord, and it's something that breaks my heart to admit and I wish I didn't, but I did. That's the difference. And what we do is, is a Christian will seek God for forgiveness, and we also pray for the ability to resist doing it a second time. We repent. Just the last time we were together, we were looking at Psalm 51. Let me remind you of what David did. Look at Psalm 51, verses 2 through 5. Notice what David said there. This is a great example of what a believer does. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my sins ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. Notice verses 7 through 9. Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy of gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, blot out all my iniquities. You see, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. See, that's what a believer does. A believer says, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me. I'm broken, I'm contrite before you. But a non-believer likes to boast about the evil that they do. And that's why in Psalm 52, verse 1, David asks that question, why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? Why do you do that? Why is it that you do that? In verse 2, continuing, your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. The word selah means meditate on this or think about it. You love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. And so he's saying you, you are destructive. The things that you have said have, have actually resulted in the death of innocent people. And this destructive speech is simply a manifestation of your evil. You love evil is what he is saying here. And you have a deceitful tongue. The Bible tells us in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He's simply saying you love evil and the things that you say and the things that you have been saying recently that resulted in the death of people only demonstrates, only manifests the evil of your heart. But he goes on in verse 5 to say, God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. And then again, he says, think about that for a moment. In other words, your life shall be brief. You may seem to have all power right now, but your life in reality is brief. This reminds me of Psalm 37, verses 35 and 36, where the psalmist said, I've seen the wicked in great power spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away. Behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. You might live many years, but in contrast to eternity, the bottom line is, is you don't have eternal life. Your life will indeed be brief. But he contrasts that now with verse 6 when he says, The righteous also shall see and fear shall laugh at him, saying, Here's the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, strengthened himself in his wickedness. 
You see, in, in initially the righteous will be in awe and even terror as they, as they witness God's hand of judgment on evil. But they're also going to see that, that they are, are, are uh, graciously spared. And in doing so, they begin to rejoice and they see that God is dealing with the evil. Now, their joy is not malicious. It's just a, sim uh, a simple vindication of God's character and His righteousness. And they're saying that He got what He deserved. Notice verse 7 here when it says, Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. We have options on, on earth as God gives to us our life and all. We have options to make decisions who we are going to trust in, who is our ultimate trust going to be placed in. We can trust in riches or we can trust in, in God. We have to make that decision. And the Bible tells us very clearly that we need to make our trust in the Lord. When Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy in chapter 6, verse 17, uh, Paul said this. He said to Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Do not trust in the uncertain riches. Don't be thinking that that bank account is going to always be accumulating interest and it's going to be growing progressively his point is, it's because you really don't know that that's going to happen for sure. If you're going to trust in anyone, trust in the Lord. And that's what God calls us to do. And that's what he speaks about in verse 8 when he says, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it, he says, is good. I'm flourishing like a healthy, well-watered tree because of your unfailing love for me. And I want people to know that. I'm producing fruit, and people can see that the fruit is, is good. You know, one of the things about the fruit of the Spirit, when you are abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're producing the fruit of the Spirit, one of the things about fruit that I've noticed with our fruit trees, and we have several fruit trees in the backyard, and one of them is a plum tree, and it's producing some of the nicest plums that we've ever had. And I, I know one thing about that fruit tree, and that is this, that the fruit is produced to be consumed by somebody else. You know, the, the tree, in other words, isn't eating its own fruit. The tree is producing the fruit, and then I come out there, and I look at it and say, Marie, could you pick me one of those plums? You know, I'll be in the house, and when you're through peeling my grapes, baby, bring me that. No, the fruit is for somebody else. And, and the fruit that God produces in your life is really in some ways for other people. And when you're planted in the things of the Lord and you're producing the fruit, that is so that others might have the benefit of what God is doing in your life. And so when you have your roots that are deeply embedded in the water of life and the Spirit is flowing through you and is producing fruit in you, it's so that others might be able to partake of the goodness that God is doing in your life. And that's part of what the Lord would have for us and for us to understand. And so he's saying, I'm a green olive tree in the house of God. And not only am I there just rooted deeply in him, but notice verse 9, he says, I'll praise you forever because you've done it. In the presence of your saints, I'll wait on your name. Not only do I quietly in my prayer closet praise you, but I want others to know that you have been so good to me that I want to just in their presence praise you also. The Bible tells us in Psalm 73, verse 28, it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. And so not only do I, in my prayer closet, say, God, you've been so good to me and how grateful I am for all that you have done, but I also will share that in the great assembly. I will also let my family know. I will let my friends know. When I have opportunity, I'll share with my neighbors. I will want other people always to know how good God has been to me. And that's what David is saying. I will praise you forever. You've done it. In the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name, for it is good. Psalm 53, continuing. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There's none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. 
There's none who does good, no, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God? There they are in great fear where no, no fear was. For God has scattered the bones of him who encamps against you. You have put them to shame because God has despised them. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when God brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Now, as you look at Psalm 53, if you've been going through the Psalms with me or if you read the Psalms by habit, you're going to notice something immediately. You're going to notice that Psalm 53 is basically a repeat of Psalm 14. It's basically the same psalm. And what this reveals once again for us is his longing for the kingdom of God. Now, as we look at it in verses 1 through 3, notice with me how David begins by saying, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Two things I want to point out. One, he refers to one as being a fool. The word fool there in the Old Testament very often simply means somebody who is morally insensible. It's a person who willfully disregards God and any of God's commandments. And the result of this person's disregard of God and His Word is that he is separated. He's separated from God, but he is also separated from the wisdom of God that is revealed to him through the Word of God. A fool will not listen to God's statements. A fool doesn't want to hear what God has to say. And so the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. And so he's saying, if you have a disregard for God and you do not respect his word, you will have a corrupt life. That's why he says in verse 1, they are corrupt, have done abominable iniquity, there's none who does good. See, this corruption in, in their life actually flows from their innermost being. It flows right out of their heart. That's why in Proverbs 4.23, we read, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Now, I want you to notice something here as we look at this. I want you to notice the fool is not necessarily simply an atheist. He is a person who disregards God. The fool may be a person who believes in God or gods, and he may even equate them all to the exclusion of the one God. When Marie and I went recently to New York, we got on the plane in the city of Ontario, and uh, as we were seated there, I sat next to the window, Marie sits in the center, and then there's a, a passenger there in the aisle seat. And I, I sit there, and I always put Marie next to the person, because I know that eventually she's going to want to visit with somebody, which is the truth. I mean, it's the truth, and that's Marie. And so... As we're seated there, here comes a gentleman. Actually, the gentleman was already sitting there, a friendly guy. And uh, he gets up and he allows us to go and take our seats and all. And we sit down and, you know, go through all the pre-flight instructions and all. And off we go. And now we're in the air. And as we're flying there, you know, I'm just seated there and Marie's there. And, and I put my earphones on and I start listening to the music. And I try and find something that might be interesting to listen to. But I know Marie. I know Marie. And so as we're seated there, I'm kind of waiting, and before, it was about 15, 20 minutes into the flight, maybe a half hour at the most, um, Marie taps me on the shoulder, and I turn and I look at her, and she's leaning back, and this gentleman is leaning forward, and he's sticking his hand out to shake my hand. So I take my earphones off, and I said, hi, how are you? And he smiles at me, and he continues his conversation with Marie. And Marie and he are talking, and before you know it, he's telling her about his life. Now, she thinks the earphones are back on, but I haven't put the earphones on. I'm just sitting there waiting because I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. And so, as she's there talking to him, he asks her, where are you going? And she says, we're on our way to New York. And he says, oh, really? Now, he's been telling her his whole life. He's a businessman. He's very wealthy. He's run for political office. I mean, he's telling her his whole story. You know, and Marie's one of these great listeners who's very interested in all. And then he says, where are you going? She says, we're going to New York. And he says, oh, really? What are you going to be doing there? He goes, I'm going to New York. My, my daughter lives there and all of this. And what are you going to be doing there? And Marie says, well, um, my husband is going to be sharing uh, at a conference uh, on marriage, is how she begins. 
And then he says, oh, really? Now, this man's been married three times. He says, oh, really? <laughs> so he's an expert. And, and, and so as, as he says, oh, really? Marie goes, yes. And then she does this. She always does this. My husband is a pastor. Oh. <laughs> really? Now, he starts telling her, I'm, he says this, I'm a philosopher. I enjoy philosophy. And I love to talk about philosophy. Now, Marie thinks my earphones are on, but they're not. I'm just sitting there waiting because I know I'm going to get a call. <laughs> and he begins to share. And before you know it, he's asking her questions. Do you think this is a sin? Then he begins to tell her, I think that this particular religious persuasion is wrong because it teaches that there's a hell and there's no such place as a hell. And, and off we're going, you know. And finally, now Marie all this time thinks I have the earphones on, and I don't. I'm just waiting. And all of a sudden, her elbow's in my rib cage, and she's starting to hit me. That's what she'll do. That's my signal. You're on, you know. It's kind of like a tag team wrestling match, you know. I've gone as far as I'm going to go. It's your turn. Here comes the destroyer or whatever, you know. And, <laughs> and so he's, he's not letting her speak is what it is. He keeps speaking over her, you know, and she's unable to get through. And then she tries to say something, and well, I don't. And so she's starting to hit me because he's not listening to her. And finally, I just leaned forward, and I said, really, you think so? And he goes, oh, yeah. Now I'm in the conversation, and Marie's <laughs> taking a breather, right? <laughs> had an interesting, interesting conversation with this fellow. I really did. You know, we had such an interesting, as a matter of fact, there was somebody who was sitting across from us who's listening into the conversation, and, and I decided to take kind of a direct route with him. Because he would say, well, you know, God is very compassionate, and I believe that he's going to allow everybody to go to heaven. And I said, that's where you're wrong. And he'd say, what do you mean? That's where you're wrong. And he said, no. He says, when people die, what they're going to do is they're going to wake up, and God's going to say, see, you, you should have followed me better, but you can come in. I said, that's where you're wrong. I said, you have a, you have a real problem with the Word of God. He says, well, that's your, your opinion. I said, no, listen. I said, what we have here, and we had an interesting time, a great conversation, a great conversation. I said, you know, your, your problem is, is you disagree with God. He says, well, I don't believe there's anything uh, that, that anybody does anything that's really wrong. I said, that's where you're wrong. I said, the people are evil. He says, people are not evil. I said, you disagreeing with God. I said, in Psalm 51, King David uses three words in one scripture to describe what we are. We, are, we, are, uh, we have transgression, we have iniquity, and we have sin. And I was sharing with him, and I just, just opened it and just continued to talk with him, and, and he'd say things, and I'd say, you know what? That's where you are wrong. You are wrong because God says this is what is truth. And finally, he said, all religions are the same. I said, that's where you're wrong. <laughs> I said, that's not true at all. He says, well, yes, they are. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, Have you, I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you ask a Muslim if somebody who blows up a bus filled with children goes to heaven for doing that? Well, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to get into that. I'm not going to ask them. And I said, you need to ask them that. You need to ask them how they know they get to heaven. And I'll tell you how they know. They know they get to heaven based on their teachings and the fact that if they kill these people in the name of God, they go to heaven. I said, that's not compassion and that's not religion. That is right. God does not approve of that. God demonstrated his love for us by sending us his son to die on the cross for us that we might have eternal life. He took the penalty upon himself. Every one of us is wicked. Every one of us is evil. Every one of us has a sin nature, and it needs to be dealt with, and only God can do that. And he said, well, I don't believe the passion of the Christ. Was, and Marie was trying to share with me. I said, listen, in the passion of the Christ, he walked out of it because he thought it was too violent. I said, you've never read Isaiah 52 and 53. If you read the Bible, you're going to see that they actually toned it down. What Jesus went through was worse than they could portray on film. Then he did that for you. He did that for me. He did that so I could have eternal life. You see, the Bible says to us, and that's what we're looking at right now, the Bible makes it very clear that the fool has said in his heart there's no God. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's saying there isn't really a God out there. What he's saying is there's no king of the universe. There's no number one God. And that's where he's wrong and that's where the Bible is right. And you need to understand that. You need to understand tonight that you have absolute truth right in your hands right now when you're holding the word of God here. This Bible is the truth. And when I was speaking to him, and we had a great time, he said, I'm your worst nightmare, aren't I? I said, no, I enjoy, I enjoy 
speaking to people like you. I like talking to you. No, this is great because I knew that that was a divine appointment because he's used to just kind of spouting his philosophy off. Interesting, he had started the conversation telling Marie, I'm a philosopher, he said. And at the end, he's saying, well, I don't want to talk philosophy, you know, <laughs> because we just went right to the Word and just, you know, this is what God's Word says. This is what God... Your argument is not with me. Your argument is with God Himself. And I told him, and what you need to do is you need to understand if God says something, it would be wise if you listened. And he goes, oh, that makes some sense. I said, well, it is... Makes sense to me. You'd be wise if you listened. And so we had an enjoyable time. He gave me his card, you know, and he said, uh, you know, he told me all about himself. And I gave him my card, and I said, why don't you come and visit us sometime? I'd love to have you come to church. And, and his name's Richard. If you think about him, his name is Richard. And I would love to see Richard come to church here one of these days. And, and I'd love to see him standing up there at the invitation, too. And let's see what the Lord can do. But anyway, I better get on with the Bible study, huh? <laughs> when a fool believes like this, the result is a corrupt life. The word corrupt means ruined or spoiled. It speaks of that which is rotten like spoiled milk. And he's saying that their lives are devoid of absolute good. In verses 2 and 3, when he says, God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There's none who does good, no, not one. He basically says that God is looking down and he examines the hearts and he examines the actions of mankind. And as he evaluates them, he judges that there are none who are seeking after Him. And that's because they do not naturally pursue Him, and therefore none can do what is right. Now, seeing that we do not naturally seek Him, the Bible tells us He seeks out us. He seeks for us. Jesus in Matthew 18, verse 11 said, The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, in chapter 34, verse 12, he wrote, uh, as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. Seeing that we don't seek him, he seeks us. I find it interesting when you study your scriptures to look at the gospel of Luke and you see how, how Jesus speaks concerning that fact. He, he speaks concerning a sheep that was lost. He speaks concerning a, a coin that was lost. He speaks concerning a son and had wandered away. And the point he makes is it's God who pursues after those that are lost. Because we have devised ways for ourselves, the Scripture says, that we think make us acceptable to Him, when in reality, we're not coming closer to Him, we're actually moving farther away from Him. As I've shared with you before, in the book of Genesis, when God gave specific commands to uh, Adam and Eve, you are not to eat of this, the fruit of this tree, for in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And you know how that Eve looked at the tree, and it was good for food. It would make her wise and all, and she wanted it so desperately, took and ate of it, gave to her husband, the Bible says. He also ate, and their eyes were opened, and they were able to see the difference between good and evil. And you know how that they were hiding behind fig leaves when they heard the voice of the Lord there in the garden, and how the Scripture tells us that God cried out and He said, Adam, where are you? Now, when you read the book of Genesis and you're just reading through it, perhaps as you read your Bible through in a year or whatever, and you're just reading and not necessarily meditating on or studying, you might pass that by and not understand exactly what's going on. Because when Adam is there in the garden and the voice of the Lord is, is, is ringing through and God is wandering through it in search of His lost son... When, when he says, Adam, where are you? It's not as if God had no knowledge, for the Word of God tells us that God is omniscient. He knows all things. It wasn't that he didn't know where Adam was because he knew exactly where he was, and it isn't that he didn't know what Adam had done because he knew exactly what Adam had done. He knows all things. So why would God say, Adam, where are you, if God already knows where he is and knows what he's done? The reason that God says, Adam, where are you, isn't so that Adam can inform God. It's so that Adam can confess to God, I am in sin. I am hiding from you for what I have done would be the ex expected answer. 
It's God seeking out Adam. You don't see in Genesis Adam running to God saying, forgive me, I have blown it. You don't see that. From the very beginning, you see God pursuing man. And by the way, when you study that also, in the original language, the connotation of God speaking to Adam when he says, Adam, where are you, also carries with it the idea of a broken-hearted father crying out for a lost son. The way that any dad in this, in this place right now might have a one-year-old toddler and you're at the store and you have the baby standing next to you and you say, Daddy's got to reach for this right now. You stay right there. i got to get this. And you turn around for just a moment, but that little energetic baby decides to take a walk and before you know it, it's crowded. You can't see the baby and your heart is filled with concern and you cry out the child's name. Where are you? That's what the Lord is doing. Very often we think of God as an arresting officer. He's angry and he's going to put you in jail. Adam, where are you? It wasn't that way at all. What God was doing was crying out to Adam with a tear in his voice saying, where are you now? Where are you now? Now that you didn't listen to my voice, now that you didn't understand my command, now that you have disobeyed, and now that you have entered into sin, where are you now? You see, so God loves us. And he even, if you will, has a tear in his voice as he cries your name out. And he seeks you out. When you're out there doing your own thing, thinking that you're doing just fine, thank you very much. It's the Lord who knows you aren't doing fine. It's the Lord that, that knows that you're lost. And it's the Lord who, who cries out through the message of the gospel by his Holy Spirit for you so that you might hear him as he cries to you and says, why don't you come home? Why don't you come home? And see, that's what takes place. It's God who is seeking us out. It's not us or we who are seeking him. In verse 4, he says of uh, Psalm 53, have, have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and, and do not call upon God? And there they are in great fear where no, no fear was. God has scattered the bones of him who encamps against you. You have put them to shame because God has despised them. Because they deny that God is evaluating them, evildoers try to devour God's people. They consider believers to be ignorant and weak and they bully them whenever possible. Notice verse 5 when he says, There they are in great fear where no fear was. The wicked will be in terror when God acts to protect his children from them. One of the scriptures that speaks to my heart with showing the, the protective interest of the Lord is in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, where Jesus said, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. When you go to Israel, we go into the city of Capernaum, and while you're in Capernaum, this ancient uh, uh, city there by the sea, when you're in this, uh, the, the ruins of Capernaum, there is a certain area, you walk through this, the whole uh, the ruins and all, and you'll find a millstone. They have a millstone there, and you're able to look at it and get an idea of what Jesus was talking about, because a millstone could weigh, weigh around 500 pounds. And so when you said it would be better for a millstone to be put around your neck, it's a picture of you being dropped out of sight forever. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, if you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better if a millstone were tied around your neck and you were dropped into the sea. In Hebrew thought, dropping into the sea is, is a place of forgetfulness where you're not going to be remembered anymore. It would be better for you to be there than to cause a believer to stumble. Now, sometimes, even in this fellowship, I see this off and on. Over the years, I've seen it a few times. I'll give an invitation. And as I'm giving an invitation, I'm inviting people, get right with God. If the Spirit of God is calling you and you need to get right with Him, give up on your sin and get right with the Lord. Get a new life. Get forgiven. Get the joy and the peace that God has to offer you. Jesus died on the cross so that you might be able to go to heaven. He purchased you with His blood, and He loves you. And somebody is there listening, saying, this is true, I really sense it. There's a sense in my heart that this isn't just a story. This applies to me. And that's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And when God begins to work in a person's heart, I have seen it before. I saw it one time in a in church service on a Wednesday night where I gave an invitation, 
and there was an argument that broke out in the back of the church because a young lady wanted to get up and commit her heart to Christ. I found out later what was going on. She wanted to get up and answer the invitation, but her boyfriend refused her to come up. He said, no, and they started to argue there. She wanted to get saved, and he was saying, no, you can't. He got up, walked out, stood outside. And then when she came out, you know, he went at it with her. You can't do that. You know, controlling even her eternity, controlling where she goes for eternity, I would not want to be that kid. I would not want to be that snotty-nosed little punk telling that little girl she should not get right with God. What kind of control is that in a person's life? That this guy is saying, you're not going to go to heaven, you're going to go to hell with me. And the little girl is saying, I don't know what to choose. Jesus said, it would be better if a millstone were tied around your neck and you were dropped into the deepest part of the sea than to offend one of these little ones who believe in me. The word offend there means to stumble them. And the Lord says, no, I don't look at that lightly. We need to keep that in mind because sometimes we'll come to church, but we don't want to get right with the Lord. We're simply putting on like we are so we can be with the person who does go to church. But the Lord is warning you in that when he says that. In verse 6, Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When God brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. And so David is longing for the Lord to rule and reign on earth. His great desire is for the Lord to deliver Israel from the presence of the wicked. And when this happens, those who love the Lord will rejoice because his honor is vindicated. Psalm 54, another psalm of David. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me. Oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble. My eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. And so Psalm 50, uh, 54 is a song that was written by David when he was being pursued by King Saul. And David has uh, been in hiding. He was in hiding in southern Israel. And uh, a group of people who uh, were called Ziphites uh, had basically told King Saul where David was. Saul went to attack him but was un unable to do so because as he went to attack King David, he was invaded by the Philistines. And so this is a psalm that was written during that time. In verses 1 and 2, David said, Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. So he's saying, Save me, God. Vindicate me. It's like a child calling out to the Father for help. And David is now crying out to the Lord. He's saying, Vindicate me. That means minister judgment. Save me, O God, by your name. When he says, save me by your name, it's just another way of saying, I know who you are and I know what you can do, and I'm trusting in you to take care of me. In verse 3, strangers have risen up against me, oppressors have sought after my life, they have not set God before them. So ruthless men with no regard for God have become my enemies. They have no mercy for me, they have no empathy for me, they only desire for me to die. But, behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. God is my one and only helper. He will sustain me. And because he can be relied upon, I will put all of my trust in him. Not just a portion of it. I will put every bit of trust that I have in the Lord. You know, that's something, by the way, that you do every day. That's something that you do, I think, what's the word, um, incrementally. When I first got saved, I said to the Lord, I'm going to love you with all of my heart. But over the last many years of being a Christian, I've learned that there are portions of my heart that I basically hadn't released to Him. And over the years, I've begun to release more and more of my heart to the Lord. 
It's kind of like when you first are dating somebody and you begin to think, gosh, I, I, I can like this person. I do like this person. I'd like to ask them out. And then you give them a call on the phone. And, and some of you remember that, what that was like when, when you were making your first phone calls, when you started to actually like somebody. And we'll say you're the guy because there's a time when the girls didn't call the guys. Now it's a little different, I realize. I wouldn't have gotten any phone calls, so I had to do the calls anyway. <laughs> but I can still remember how, how I would find out, you know, that somebody might be interested in going out with me. And I'd get really nervous and everything, and I'd wait till there was nobody around. My mom and my dad were gone. My sisters, everyone. It was just me and the phone. And I got hold of the phone number somehow, asked a friend or whatever, and I got her phone number. And then I would sit there, and I would look at the phone. I just would stare at that phone thinking, oh, man, oh, man. But you ought to call. I don't know. Will she know who I am? I don't know. I don't know. How, I would try it. Well, no. And I'd pick it up, and I'd look at it, and I'd put it down, and I'd hope somebody would come home, and, oh, and I'm, I'm sweating. And then finally, I'd lift it up, and I'd dial it up, and ring, ring, and then the, that voice comes on the other end of the line, hello, uh, <clears throat> hello, is this uh, so-and-so? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know me, but I sit by you in English, and, and, uh, and my name is David, and... And, oh, yeah, I know who you are, that goofy-looking guy, right? Yeah, that's me. Uh, you're Bill's friend, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering. And, you know, and you get this nervous feeling and everything, and you take them out for the first time, and then you start dating them, and before you know it, you're starting to like them more and more and more. You're getting more casual with them. You're getting to know them better and all. And over time, you might even get to the point where you say, I don't just like this person. I think I love this person. And then you get to that point, you know, that you start thinking, I think I, could, I think I could stay with this person the rest of my life. I think I'm going to ask her to marry me. I can remember when Marie and I were dating, we'd been dating for some time, I finally turned to her and I said, Marie, if I were to ask you to marry me, what would your answer be? She looks at me and she says, I would say yes. I said, Great. If I ever think of asking you to marry me, <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I really did that. <laughs> I really did that. I didn't ask her to marry me for months after that. I'm serious. And she looked at me like, I, see, I, 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 I don't know. My mom dropped me when I was a child. What can I say? I mean, I, I had no social skills whatsoever, none whatsoever and all of that. I'm surprised that she stayed with me for so long. But you know, you get to that point where you say, I love you, then you ask to get married. And when, Marie, when I asked Marie to marry me, I, I had a Bible study in Ontario. I invited the people who were originally part of that Bible study, and, and I opened up Proverbs 31, and I read the passage of the virtuous woman, and, and I looked at Marie, and I said to her, you know, Marie, in my family, there's a tradition uh, I don't, you can't really see this right now, but some of you may notice I have a ring on my right hand here. It's a, it's a ruby ring. It's gold with ruby. And I said to Marie, I said, you know, this ring here, Marie, is the ring that my father gave to my mom when he asked her to marry him. I said, this is the ring that my brother gave to his wife when he asked her to marry him. It's a tradition in our family for the men to take the ring and to give it to the woman that he wants to marry. And I said, would you wear this ring? And she looked at me and she said, yes. And she took it and put it on and it was a very emotional time. And we stepped into love. But now we have been loving each other for many, many years. And incrementally I've discovered that every day as her husband, I wake up and I pray, and this is the truth, that I want to love her more today and better today than I did yesterday. I want to love you more today than I did yesterday. Incrementally, you grow that way. See, I might have some new Christians in here who are saying, I don't think I'm ever going to be strong. No, if you wake up every morning saying, Jesus, I love you today, and I want to love you more today than I did yesterday. You know what? Over the weeks and over the months, and should the Lord tarry over the years, your love will grow 
and grow and your commitment grows and grows. See, I get concerned for young believers because you can get discouraged because you, you, you know that you, you've got weaknesses and you know that you still stumble and you know that you still blow it. And you might be saying, when am I going to get so old that I don't do that? In the Lord, when is it going to happen when it's all? It, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen this side of heaven. But you do draw closer to the Lord every day and you do recommit yourself in love to Jesus every day. It's a love relationship that God wants you to have with Him, you see? It's not a religion that we have. It's a relationship with Him. It's, 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 it's treating Jesus as if He's your friend. It's loving Him for what He's done for you. It's talking to Him as you talk to your closest friend and knowing that He listens to you. It's reading the words so that He can speak back to you. And, all, and, and you set your heart on him. That's because the Lord, as he says in verse 4, the Lord is your helper, and the Lord is with those who uphold his life. See, the Lord loves you, and the Lord works within you. He sustains you. He is your only helper, and you put all your trust in him. In Psalm 118, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. God in Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Don't be afraid. I will never leave you, and I will never, never, ever forsake you. I love you. And I think that that is a wonderful promise to hold fast to. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good, for he has delivered me out of all trouble. And my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. I want you to see verse 6, I will freely sacrifice to you. I voluntarily give to you offerings with thanks. Many years ago, before we received offerings in this church, for a great number of years, we didn't receive offerings. We simply had agape boxes, and, uh, and the Lord supplied our needs. And I was invited at one time to join with a group of uh, pastors in the local area, and there was going to be an outreach. And I was invited to join in a planning meeting with uh, several other pastors. And as we gathered together, I can still remember that they began to discuss the finances, what is it going to cost to put on this outreach and all. And, and one of the guys, one of the pastors, turned to me and said, uh, David, what do you do for offerings in your church? And I said, we don't receive offerings. And he looked at me and he says, and it was it, it flabbergasted. There was a, a group of the guys and, and, and it flabbergasted him. And he said, no, wait a minute. What do you mean you don't receive offerings in your church? I said, we don't receive offerings. I said, not that I'm opposed to it, we just don't. And he says, then how do you pay your bills? How do you... And I looked at him and I said, well, you teach them the Word. If you teach the Bible to people, they fall in love with God and they freely give to Him. We don't have to force people to give. People give because they love Him. And that's what David is talking about in verse 6. I will freely sacrifice to you. There's no pressure at all. I love you, you love me, and I'm giving to you. So we're in New York and... Uh, we're walking by these shops all over the place, and I have a little chain on Marie holding her back. No, we're, and we're, we're going through these different, <laughs> these different shops, and, and it's Monday, and we're going to be leaving, and I wanted to get my grandson uh, a present, and so we find the Yankee shop there, and uh, we go into the Yankee shop, and, and I found uh, some little outfit, you know, New York Yankees, number 13 Rodriguez, and, and I, I brought it home for him. Uh, I didn't feel compelled to have to do that. Oh, Josiah's going to be mad at me if I don't bring him a gift. You know, Josiah doesn't know anything like that yet. He will someday, but not yet. His mom will probably teach him that. But um, all I know is I feel compelled in my heart to bring home something for my grandson. I feel compelled in my heart to bring something for my boys. I, I'm always compelled in my heart to bring something to give to them as a gift. It's a way of saying, I was thinking of you, and I love you, and, and while I was gone, my heart wasn't gone. My heart was still with you, and I brought you this because I wanted you to have this. You know what? That's something like when I give my gifts to my Lord. I was thinking of you, and I love you, 
and I voluntarily give to you because I love you. And I want you to know that. That's how you give your offerings to God. Not a compunction. I have to give. Uh-oh, here comes that bucket here. I'll pretend I drop my comb on the ground when it comes by and just hand it to the person next to me, you know. <laughs> no. You give because you love. And if you're in love with the Lord, it's easy, isn't it? When you're in love, it's easy. When you give with compunction and you force to, compel to, that's not love. Let me give you something you might not like to hear, but it's the truth. Valentine's Day, many years ago, I come home, and I didn't have a gift for Marie. I was busy, and I don't care about Valentine's Day. And I came home. Who? <laughs> And um, it, it, it didn't set right with her. I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, so I said, you want a gift? I'll go get you a gift. And I leave, and I go and brought some perfume, bought some perfume, came back, and I put it on the counter. I said, here's your gift. I was not a good man. <laughs> Marie didn't appreciate the gift. I, I still to this day don't know why. She took it back and said, here's your money. I don't want your gift. And you want to know something? She was right. She was right. She was right because my heart was not right in giving that to her. And she was right in the way that she did it. And by the way, I did ask for forgiveness, and I did repent from that and, and all of that. You know, you have to or you don't eat. <laughs> Can I hear a masculine amen? Um, <laughs> the couch isn't very comfortable, but... I had to learn. I had to learn these gifts. You know, these things I learned through living. Just uh, if you give a gift to somebody and you do it like that, do they want it? Well, why would I think that my gifts to the Lord would be accepted by Him? If my wife won't accept perfume, and it was good perfume, by the way. It was nice, you know, but she didn't accept it because the heart wasn't right. Then why would I think that God wants me to give Him a grudging gift? He doesn't. You give because you love. And that's all that David is saying. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Call upon the name of the Lord, he says in Psalm 116, verse 17. And God, he's simply saying, I love you, I praise you, I give to you. Why? You delivered me out of all trouble. My eye has seen its desire upon my enemies because you take care of me and you love me. Listen, all I'm saying is I've been looking at this psalm and what I'm trying to say is we just need to fall in love with the Lord. And if you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, or you at one time were following him and you've stepped away, my encouragement to you is to come back and to come back tonight. He loves you still, and he's still calling out for you.